conversation. Uh, and it's a conversation that starts with, uh, you know, a picture that you know, um, which basically is on, your, on the cover of your uh, program. So I know that this is one that you're familiar with. But as I've been looking at that picture, because it comes up a lot, it's a wonderful way to start the conversation about the difference between equality and equity. Um, if you look online and you look at sort of other things that folks have done with it, people have begun to get creative. And I want us to take a little time today to get even more creative. So the first thing to recognize is when we talk about, and you heard it in the video that we just heard, when we talk about moving from equality to equity, it's, it's also useful to start with an image of where we are now, which is nowhere near equity. So if we're going to use these images, Sometimes it's useful just to start with an image of the reality, which is, frankly, that, as you heard in the video, the young people who have the most privileges, in particular the most economic privileges, the most community privileges, along with being in an affluent family, living in an affluent neighborhood, are not only sort of overall healthier and more engaged, they've got more boxes to stand on. So they're looking far over that fence compared to that young person who's standing at the bottom. So that's the first thing that we're doing. So we're, we're looking at that, how do we go from talking about equity to, talk, to talking about equality and talking about equity? Because we want to jump over that step and get there. The second thing, however, is, and I like this image in particular, when we draw a picture of equity, and we sort of basically draw it in that simple way as you saw before, that the size of the children is different, in some ways, we're putting the blame on them. We're saying, wait a minute, these kids aren't starting equal, so they need more boxes. So what I like about this image, if we're gonna sort of play with this idea of moving from equality to equity, is it demonstrates that the playing field literally is not level. Some young people are starting down lower and also that the barriers are equal. The fence is higher. So if you just take a careful look at that image, what you see is you've got two things stacked against young people. They're coming out of neighborhoods and environments that don't have all the resources that the young person standing on that, the, the blue young person does. And when they try to move forward in the world, they hit bigger fences. And if we're going to play with these images, let's, let's play with them and make them really tell the full story. But now look at this one. And I love the fact that they added a third uh, image. Because we don't just want to make sure that we have enough boxes that all young people have the opportunity to see over the fence. We actually want to remove the fence. I mean, that really is where we're going, right? How do we actually get that fence down so that young people are not just observers of what could be, they have the feeling that they can actually walk onto that field. So what I liked about this one is that they actually then encouraged us. There was a fourth box, but then they said, what's your idea? So what I want to do is to talk to you a little bit about what your idea is and ask the question, especially for the folks in this room who are so committed to this issue, is moving the fence enough? Is reducing the barriers enough? Is that a big enough goal for us? So I did my version of picture smithing, I guess you would call it. And if you can see what I did, one young person is now on the field. So what does it take not to just take the fence down so that young people feel that they have the opportunity to go on the field, but actually make sure that they have the skills and the confidence and the pathways to get them onto the field. Because isn't that our end goal, to actually get them into the game, not just being able to see the game? Is that right? Does that make sense? So you know, maybe one of your exercises after I'm gone is drawing your own picture. But what I want to talk about is what is our role in certainly making sure that we're stacking up the boxes, certainly making sure that we're taking down the fences, but what we're uniquely qualified to do because of the kinds of deep and sustaining relationships we build with young people 
is to help them make sure they have the competencies and the sense of identity and the sense of agency that they need to walk onto that field and succeed. And that's really where we should be going. So about a decade ago, a little more than a decade ago, this concept of youth development, which we've been talking about for a long time, as we really tried to move it down the finish line with policymakers, we found that if you have 10 minutes to talk to people and you went in to say youth development, we were spending eight minutes describing what youth development was or wasn't. Youth development, oh, you just mean mentoring. No, I don't just mean mentoring. So we started defining it in terms of the end goals. We want to talk to you about what it takes to make sure all young people are ready for college, ready for work, ready for like. You can substitute in whatever words you want in that, but basically we talked about what the end goal was, and we picked 21 just because it was more than 18. We wanted to send the signal that our support for young people doesn't automatically stop at the end of high school, that some young people need extra time, and that even young people who graduate from high school need that sustained support. So we started that conversation. We brought groups together, intentionally building partnerships outside of the after-school, out-of-school community, building what are now often referred to as sort of collective impact partnerships, but really getting those folks around the table who really can understand more broadly what it takes for young people to be successful, having conversations with business leaders, getting this into the federal government, all the things that you know, and state and local governments. We did that for a while, and we made serious progress. But then we realized we needed to do more. We needed to tackle head on this question of how readiness connected to equity. And so we started something called the Readiness Project, which really was a two-year project to look at where the fields, and I say fields plural, where they were going, not just youth development and after school and out of school, but K-12 education, higher education, youth employment, child welfare, juvenile justice, social services, civic education. What was the conversation that was happening about why young people weren't being successful in those systems with whatever the definition of success was in those systems? And what you saw was an increasing emergence or convergence really on this idea of social and emotional skills. Lots of different language, 21st century skills, soft skills, life skills, lots of language, but the same idea that somehow, whatever our goal was, whether it was to prevent teen pregnancy or increase college attendance and college completion, we were missing the boat because we were not spending enough time focusing on building young people's competencies in these critical areas. So we did that, and that really looks, and you can find all this, I'll put the websites up in a second, you can find all this on, up on our website, the research that we did to look across, and I'll share a little bit with you. Then we also dug in to the after-school community and worked with eight exemplary youth organizations to help them literally deconstruct what they do in their daily practice. And their daily practice was everything from building boats to teen pregnancy to youth governance, very different content working with middle and high school students. But we asked them, we know you care about these skills. How do you know you're doing everything that you can to build them and get young people to use them? And so they volunteered to work with us and, and a group of researchers to really name and own the skill sets, the skill domains that they thought they were working on that were observable, that they thought you actually could see a measured difference, a measured improvement. And then they looked at specific ways their practices were linked to those skills. And all of that is up in Preparing Youth to Thrive. That work was done with the Susan Crown Exchange. And I'm assuming the slides will all be available later so you can get all the web links. Now this stuff has been going on for a long time, but we've made a huge amount of progress. And that's what I want us to really capitalize on. I think the last time I spent a serious amount of time in California, I was going up and down the coast when the National Research Council report came out in 2002. And we were really celebrating the idea that we finally had a common language around what it is that young people need to succeed and what the definition of quality learning environment was, whether it was in school, out of school, in a family, in a youth employment program. So we certainly got this idea that young people not need more than academic skills to be successful. 
reinforcing the things we already know, the things we used to call youth development. What we have now, which is so exciting, is another batch of research, this coming out of the University of Chicago, um, their Center for uh, Chicago School Reform. Again, looking across the fields and giving us this wonderful way of not just talking about this sort of alphabet soup of skills. Do we want young people to have grit or persistence or, you know, but really telling us this is about making sure young people have knowledge and skills, have the right kind of mindsets, have self-regulation, have values. And when we have that conversation about character, and I love that quote, where did Michael go? I love the, the distinction um, about what we do in character development. But often that word values is one that we stick in or we pull it out and they put it in just the right place. We need to have knowledge and skills. We need to have the right kind of growth mindsets. Clearly self-regulation is the foundation of all this, but it really doesn't get activated until you add in values. And it's those values and that mix of those things that give young people a sense of that they can be competent, that they have an integrated identity, that they can move from one situation to another, and most important, that they have a sense of agency. So I love the way that just this adds up. And the final thing that they do that I think is great, they explicitly say, these developmental experiences that contribute to growth in these areas are in families, schools, and they say organized activities. They don't just say this nebulous term community. We are the organized activities. We can be in school, we can be out of school, but this idea that we complement what is currently called school with voluntary organized activities is critically important. And then they cut to the chase and tell us what those developmental experiences require. And they basically require that young people have opportunities to act and they have opportunities to reflect. In other words, they require engagement, not just participation that we count off with a checklist. You know, did this young person participate a certain number of hours? They require active engagement. Learning doesn't happen until we have engagement. Engagement is a combination of action and reflection. So it's a wonderfully elegant framework. And if you haven't seen it, there's a wonderful two-page infographic that you can download. Have, how many people have seen this? Of course, it's California, right? <laughs> so, you know, the bottom line is that when we're talking to young people, and this is the companion work that we did coming out of the, the readiness project, the Ready by Design, young people need to have this broad sense of abilities, and we need to name them. One of the primary things that we do in the after school setting and that you all are now doing increasingly in schools in California is not just thinking that our job is to teach the skills, but that our job is to name the skills. Because young people come in with them often, they just don't know they're important or they don't know how to apply them in this setting. And so we really have to do that translating for them. And in the discussion, if you want, I can give you some wonderful examples of what happens when we just help young people name them and reflect on where they have used them, in school or out. But the thing that we really want to get to is if you're creating those opportunities, those developmental experiences, what it means is that when you look across settings where young people spend their time, we have to be more specific about what quality developmental environments look like, and it's all the things that we just said. They have to be safe, they have to be supportive, they have to be caring. What the people in them look like, they have to be relationship driven, but they also have to be outcome driven. This is not just about hugging and caring about kids, it's about helping young people set goals and find pathways. The experiences then are critical, and that's what the Chicago folks have been defining, as well as when they talk about action and reflection, how we organize young people in space and time whether we put them into 45 minute classes and run them through, all of those things are there. Now, one of the things that's interesting and one of the breakthroughs that we've been having is you can go into any environment where young people spend their time and you can deconstruct it against that map. If I ask you to describe the traditional school, you're gonna picture, at least on the East Coast, I'm gonna picture a red brick building, I'm gonna walk in a door, there's a big hallway, there are gonna be classrooms, I can describe the environment. I can describe the people. Those people have job descriptions. I can describe what they do, what they look like. 
Each environment that young people go in can be described. The question that we have to ask, we really do have to ask, because we've spent the most time creating environments that are focused on maximizing the opportunities for these developmental experiences. We have to ask the question, what happens when official practice, the official way that environments are defined, that people are hired and trained and told to do their jobs, that experiences are organized into classes or curricula, et cetera, that space and time is organized, what happens when the official doesn't have room for the developmental? What happens when the official doesn't have room for the developmental? Because I believe that in the next five years, what you all have just started to do in California that Michael described is going to start to happen around the country. That the conversation with after-school providers is not just going to be a where and when conversation, it's going to be a what and why and how conversation. And we have got to be very articulate, not just about the fact that we scoop up the kids when they come out of the building, but about what we do with them, why we do it, and how we do it, so that we can figure out how that becomes to be infused in the other settings in which they spend their time. We have had more time than anyone and more flexibility, admittedly less resources, but more time and more flexibility to get this right. And we're gonna have an opportunity to not just set up complementary services, but inform what happens in these other settings. So, what are the implications of all this new stuff for after-school and out-of-school providers? If we really are committed to increasing equity and readiness, we clearly have to complement school efforts, what we're doing right now, right? So we have to really work closely with schools and figure out how we complement those efforts, how information and data comes across the lines so we know what kids are coming out of and we can communicate back what they've learned. We clearly have to double down on our commitment to improve the quality of the developmental experiences that we offer. We have no choice but to hold ourselves accountable because the spotlight is gonna be on us because we say we've been doing this stuff. So now that people are thinking it's important, we need to show what it looks like. We need to understand and address the quality and the quantity of programming offered in the neighborhoods and communities that we serve. And I'm gonna spend a little bit more time on this, so I'm gonna get challenging. We can't, and I'm not saying you do this in California, but I go into too many neighborhoods in which when I meet with the set of after-school providers, they can't tell me the denominator. They can tell me how many young people they serve. They can't tell me how many young people need to be served, how many young people are in those neighborhoods, where the ones who are not coming to their program are going. We've got to get out of our boxes and understand what's going on in young people's lives. We've got to advocate for changes and conditions beyond our doors, including but not limited to changes in schools. And then we have to ensure that young people are motivated and capable to take advantage of and even seek out opportunities, not only within the programs that we offer, but in the settings in which they spend time. Right? In other words, we've got to grow advocates. That's our job. It really is our job, especially if we're focused on working in communities in which, as Ellen Gannett said, you know, and, and Margaret Brodkin, those opportunity gaps are enormous. Those gaps are not going to change themselves. And then finally, we have got to then, as I said, inspire and support young people and their families to change those conditions. So let's get to a picture that I want to share, and then let's have a conversation. We are building competencies for young people that they carry into other settings, which may not be as developmentally, as developmentally supportive. The good news is those settings are acknowledging that those skills are important. The bad news is that they're not, not necessarily set up to build them. They can acknowledge them. And so a part of what we are doing is giving young people a robust enough experience about naming the skills, building the skills, and using the skills that they understand how to take them into places that are not as supportive and welcoming, but that they have to go into anyhow. So that means that we've got to help young people put these competencies into their backpack, 
we can talk about a sort of a readiness abilities backpack or a competencies backpack that they then take with them as they go into other settings. That's what we have a chance to do with young people. Because what we know we're doing and what we know is happening now across the country is not just more and more support for after school, but also acknowledgement of some of the major traps that lead to differences. Because as we know, when you're looking at systems that are more formal, we often have age used as a proxy for stage. We don't graduate our young people because they change, you know, they've been in the program a certain amount of time or they're now not 12 but they're 13. We look at who they are developmentally and we work with them from that perspective. Because, whoops, didn't mean to go back far. You know, completion as a, com as a proxy for competence. All of these things are slowly moving but we can help them because we have had the luxury of starting on the right end of the equation, right? So we can argue against that and help young people argue against it. Time as a proxy for progress. Access as a, as a proxy for quality. All of those are things that lead our young people to spend time in systems that actually can do them harm. And our job has to be to call it out and to help young people understand why they leave an environment in which they feel comfortable and competent and they can move into an environment in which they feel unwelcome and incompetent. That's got to be our job to help them understand how they're moving between these systems. So this is what I think we need to do. And I actually just drew this picture up on flip chart paper just last week, literally, when I was meeting with a set of local youth organizations that are trying to figure out how to live up to a new mission statement that they've written that's about changing lives for young people. About 20 years ago, actually really about 30 years ago, when I used to work at the Children's Defense Fund, Marion Wright Edelman started, and I love her dearly, started a, 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 an annual uh, celebration of young people who had beat the odds. And absolutely, these are young people who have overcome incredible obstacles to get to college, to be successful, et cetera, and we should celebrate individual young people who beat the odds. But that's not our job. Our job is to change the odds. We can't do this one young person at a time. Right? We can't pick out our favorite young person, the one who is the easiest to work with, the smartest, the most competent, and say, I'm gonna help you get over the fence. You know? We have gotta take the fence down. We have got to change the odds. We've got to look at the structural things and help change the odds for young people. So what does that mean? Well, it means we have to acknowledge that often what we're doing is bringing kids into a box. It may not be a square box, but young people are participating in after school activities. That means they're coming into our box. Now the first thing we want to do is to make sure that that box is a quality box, that we're deepening the color of the experiences and maybe we start to actually serve more kids. Those are the typical things that we say we're gonna do, right? We're gonna reach more and we're gonna do better. All right, that's good. Now maybe I'm really doing that even more. I've added some partners in that have allowed me to think about doing more things for more young people in my program. Now I've gotta ask the question, what else is out there? Who are the other boxes? How are we connecting to those other boxes so that young people are either moving between them as they move out of one organization into another? They have interests that take them across the street, down the road. How are we more cognizant of who all the boxes are? How do we become a network of boxes that really owns the denominator of young people in that community? So we put sort of a network around that set of individual boxes we don't just know them casually and do informal relationships. We actually start to say we have a shared commitment to the young people in this neighborhood or in this community. How do we then acknowledge that when those young people walk out of our collective doors, they are still walking into environments that may be red? What's our job then to understand who else is working on those broader issues, whether those issues are housing or healthcare or transportation or the you know, prison pipeline. Who else is working in those neighborhoods? What is our job to work with them? 
How are we making sure that the young people in our boxes are equipped to come out and begin to advocate for change with their families? So how do we go from being happy that we are a box providing quality programming for young people who come in our doors to being a set of providers who understand who else is in the neighborhoods we're working in, what the conditions are that young people and families are facing, and how we're gonna organize and help them finally organize to make change. That's the challenge that I think we have in front of us. That's the opportunity that I think we have in front of us. So let me end on a personal note. This is my personal note. That's my grandson, he just visited. His name is Theo, he's two years old. Theo lives in St. Louis. He lives down there in that little dot, that green dot with a circle around it, in the central west end around the universities in St. Louis, in sort of a quasi-gated community because 150 years ago, the gates were built, not a recent one, and the gates are actually sort of open, but nonetheless, symbolically, in a very affluent community with kids who come out and play in the streets and all kinds of good things, with a wonderful private school, two blocks at the end of, the, end of their block that they're already on the list to make sure he can go to. So Theo has a good life. When Theo was born, it was the week of the riots in Ferguson. Ferguson's the other dot. It's eight miles away. But the distance between Ferguson and the central west end of St. Louis is obviously in much more than miles. The conversation in Theo's house is all about readiness. The conversation in Ferguson was a desperate conversation about equality, equal treatment by the police. Moving towards equity, there was no readiness conversation. There was no room for a readiness conversation. There was nobody going in to Ferguson asking, how are we gonna make sure these young people are prepared? So when we talk about what we are going to do as after school and out of school time providers, we have got to remember that we've got the power to address these huge issues because we have the opportunity to touch young people's lives, to get to know them, to get to know their families, and to empower them to change conditions. So we have to rise to the challenge of going from being the where and when people who have been available and ready to play a complementary role to being the what, why, and how people who are gonna be adamant about what it takes to help young people be ready to change the odds for themselves and their families because readiness should be a right for all young people and we are a part of that solution. Thank you.